Hello, and welcome to the Health Trip Podcast with me, Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach located in Chicago. I'm the founder of Jill Foos Wellness, a private concierge health coaching business where I work with individuals, groups, and corporations diving deep into helping folks discover their own unique health equation to optimize their wellness. Join me and my guests as we venture down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms, perusing new innovative therapies, modalities, and protocols while living our best life. On today's podcast, I welcome Autumn Breen. Autumn began her career working as a medical assistant in internal medicine. Her passion for skincare led her to pursue a career in aesthetics. She studied aesthetics at Naperville Skin Institute in 2009 and is a licensed esthetic. She has built upon her education in aesthetics by working with dermatologists, plastic surgeons, and in medical spas. She extended her knowledge by taking advanced courses in product knowledge and treatments and provides a full array of medical aesthetic treatments such as chemical peels, dermaplaning, microneedling, and laser and light skincare treatments. In her spare time, she enjoys sharing the outdoor adventures with her two teenage boys. Welcome, Autumn. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I forgot to say that Autumn is also my dear friend and therapist while I am laying vertical under whatever modality I've chosen that day. So we go way back. Um, before we start, I do want to just say a little medical disclaimer here that while Autumn and I are going to be talking about all things skincare, pharmaceuticals may come up, modalities may come up, different types of treatment always, always, always go back to your primary care physician or your dermatologist and talk over these suggestions or treatments or um, tips before you make any changes in your personal life. So we are going to be talking about skincare today. I met Autumn through my functional medicine doctor's office years ago, and she's been part of my health equation to my beautiful, glowing, youthful skin ever since then. She has a special knack for envisioning a long-term, sustainable, healthy skin program for each of her clients, including me, by starting to heal whatever skin issues you may have at first and then building off of that. Her skill, her skill in achieving that is much like health coaching and that I start by helping my clients heal underlying health issues, and they, I build upon that to achieve their health goals. It's a process that takes time, commitment, and it's a partnership with your esthetician. Many people who have ventured down the aesthetic skincare path know that it can cost a fortune. So for today, Autumn and I are mostly going to focus on uh, talking about healthy skincare routines that aren't going to cost you an arm and a leg, how to choose the safest and most effective products on the market, and then dive into some really cool stuff on lasers and light therapy, PRP, because one day you might want to try something new and I want you to be well versed in what it's all about. So Autumn, before we dive in, share with us how you even caught the skincare bug coming from being a medical assistant. So I remember being five years old, like mixing up masks on my kitchen floor with baby powder and water and everything else I could figure out to mix and I've always been interested in improving the look of my skin, um, but a kind of winding road took me through to uh, being a medical assistant, which was never my passion, but oh my goodness. Hang on a second. Podcasting, at home. podcasting. Your dog got my dog going. <laughs> exactly. Podcasting in the home office. Sorry about that. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I went into medical assisting. Actually, I was a nail tech first and um, it was just kind of a way to dip my toes into the aesthetic field and, um, and ended up with a shoulder injury, went into medical, um, uh, medical assisting, which I love, but um, kind of got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I was like, I want to make people happy. I want to work with healthy people. Um, and I just dropped everything, went to aesthetic school and, you know, prayed that it would all work out and it did. So I'm very blessed to be able to do what I love every single day. 
And so many people are blessed to have you do what you love every single day because you are a skin magician. So before we can really talk about all these really cool skincare tips and modalities, I guess we should talk about what skin even is and you know what, what's going on underneath what we see. Yeah, so skin is our largest organ. Um, it helps protect us, it helps eliminate waste, um, it's mostly composed of a protein called keratin um, and, of course, water um, and uh, lipids or oils. And there's seven layers to the skin, um, but for the, our purposes, we'll say the epidermis and the dermis. Mm -hmm. And the epidermis is mostly where we slough off those dead skin cells. There's just layer upon layer of those. Um, dermis is kind of where the, the magic happens, where we can make good changes to the skin that are more lasting changes. All right, so the epidermis is what we see on the outside and the dermis is the layer on the inside. So where is the collagen? So collagen is in the, the dermis of the skin. It's kind of like, um, if you think of the skin like, like a mattress, like collagen's the, the springs that keeps it kind of plump and, and firm. And as we lose that, it gets more saggy and that's where we get wrinkles and um, laxity. And based on science, when does collagen start breaking down? Like how old are we when that change starts happening? So about 20 years old, it starts happening. That's just not fair. It's not fair. It's not. Aging is not for the weak. It's I mean, I go back and I think about, you know, when I grew up in the suburb of Chicago, we had a pool and <laughs> every day after school or every day after camp, or if I wasn't in camp, I was at that pool, like with oil on my body and one yeah. of those silver things, right? Yes, the, the, yes. the reflectors <laughs> just destroying my skin. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And how old was I then? Like 13 to, you know, 20, just destroying mm -hmm. and, and making some long lasting um, obstacles for when I aged. Oh, absolutely. I did tanning beds for years, love them. That just addicted to that vitamin D, that good feeling. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until I got my first spot and I noticed that just one little brown spot and I was like, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> and stopped immediately. And I, that's often I tell young people like, you know, wear your sunscreen. Yes, of course, we're trying to uh, be healthy and prevent skin cancer, but you're gonna get wrinkles and spots. And that usually is a bit more scary to people when they're young, so. The fact that you were even connecting the dots at such a young age about a spot on your skin and the sun mm. and how how long you were out there is really incredible. Most of us are just out there and we don't even care. We're not even thinking about these things. Oh, it just, yeah, I got, I got scared straight and um, I'm very fair. So I wasn't my, I wasn't meant to be in the sun, wasn't meant to it. And so like I tried laying out when I was a kid and I would just burn and right. I basically beat my skin into submission so that it would tan. And the thought of somebody doing that now, I mean, makes me cringe, but um, so, at, so at age 20, it's going to, our collagen is going to start yeah. dwindling away. And how much is it dwindling away every year? I mean, it depends on lifestyle environments. Mm. I mean, somebody who is, you know, tanning a smoker in a polluted area, eating crap like sugar, um, they're gonna age much faster and lose collagen at a much more rapid rate um, than somebody who is conscious of what they're putting in their body and their environment around them. And we're gonna talk about like the best foods and nutrition um, and nutrients to eat in your diet to maintain healthy skin. But we do know collagen is a protein and there's collagen in like animal foods, right? So. That's why when you see diehard vegans and then someone who eats a substantial amount of animal protein, there's such a difference in their skin texture. I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, I think it's very important 
for vegans to be conscientious of getting some sort of uh, balance of proteins and fats, especially um, right. because, um, you know, I'm not going to say one is right, wrong or indifferent, but you definitely need that, that balance in, in your diet to have it show on your skin. Absolutely. What about elastin? What's so elastin? elastin is the, is also a chain of amino acids that um, basically give the skin its bounce back. So when we, when we pinch our skin, it goes, bounces right mm. back to where it was. When we age, we pinch our skin and it kind of stays that way and kind of slowly goes back. So elastin um, up until recently wasn't something that we could put back in the skin, but now they've made so many innovations with like peptides that we're actually able to um, help repair elastin now. So that's that's been a, a big leap. Um, but again, you, you need to uh, take care of your environment. You have to uh, take care of what you intake. And um, and then of course, what you put on your skin too. To protect yeah, your skin. so we touched on some of the elements that wreak havoc on your healthy skin. Things yeah. like too much sun exposure, not eating well, um, stress, illness, pollution in the environment. What are some other things? So, um, what do we go over? Stress, pollution, diets. Um, what about the products we're using? Oh, uh, products we're using are important. Um, a lot of, I mean, there's so much out there. There's so much out there. There's so much misinformation as well. So, you really want to take a look at ingredients. You need to um, kind of eliminate different toxins, look out for things like aluminum in your products. Um, and there is a website called Environmental Working Group that mm -hmm. actually has a uh, part of it where you can actually input products to see like how toxic is your product and make good choices based on that. Yeah. So I have an app on my phone called Think Dirty and you can scan products, not like top level medical grade skincare products are hard to scan and they're not really in there, but the stuff that you would find at, you know, Walgreens or Costco or the grocery store or, you know, other, um, makeup products, they'll all be in there and you can scan them and they will list how many toxins are on there. They, they rate them. And it's like a yellow, a green, yellow, and a red rating scale with numbers. So you can see, and most of the toxins are in the fragrances that they add to these. Yes, which is so unnecessary. Right. Who cares? Why do we need our, our face to smell pretty? I don't understand that. Right. Usually when I have a product and it smells too pretty, I'm not kind of um, gives me a little pause. Like why, why is this smelling good? Um, not really like I want it to smell bad. I'd, I'd prefer it just to be very neutral or if there's a, like essential oils that make it smell good, fine. But, um, I think fragrance is very unnecessary for skincare. If someone is just running into a shop and they have to go buy some face lotion or face wash, is there something on the product that we should be looking for to tell us it's safe or not safe? I mean, I look for fragrance-free, dye-free, uh, non-comedogenic, um, uh, basically. Um, what about all the parabens and the um, sulfates? So parabens, there are good and bad parabens. I, although I think most products are going just towards paraben-free. Um, so yeah, you can look for paraben free um, sulfates. I'm not, I'm not certain how um, detrimental they are to the skin, to be honest. Um, and it's not so much that they're detrimental to the skin, but they're detrimental to our endocrine system, which is our hormones. Okay. And so a woman my age, especially I'm 53 and going through menopause and trying to work on staying balanced and using hormone replacement therapy or whatever it is somebody's trying to do. It's so important to 
not bring in these exogenous toxins because they go straight, like our, like you said, our skin's our largest organ. So these toxins are gonna go straight to the bloodstream and then just wreak havoc in so many ways. So really important to read those labels. But what's confusing is you walk in to these stores and it'll say on the package, like, number one dermatologist, you know, recommended product. And then you turn the package around and it's filled with like a bunch of crap. Right, right. You know, um, and it's confusing for the consumers out there. I just had a patient yesterday who came in and I'm, I'm not going to mention the, the brand that they were told to use, but it was- Well, that's not fun. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I need to bad mouth any brand or company, but it was, uh, the ingredients were quite lengthy and it, and on top of that, it wasn't appropriate for their skin type. And so, um, I have mad respect for dermatologists. I just think sometimes they don't have enough time to go through everything involved. And, um, we ended up sending them back to the store. They got a, a fragrance free, dye free because their, their skin was very irritated from the product. So, um, Really, it's just, you know, the simpler the the ingredient list, the better, I would say, if you're going over the counter and um, you want to make sure that it's not something that makes your skin feel like tight, dry, um, irritated, because that's actually going to cause like more oil, more breakouts. So um, you want to pay attention to both ingredients and how your skin feels when you use it. Right. And um I want to talk about the order in which we're supposed to apply all of these creams, potions, and lotions because in sprays and serums and it's so, confusing. <laughs> so confusing, but there's got to be like just a, a basic, simple outline that most people aren't really aware of in terms of layering on top of our epidermis. Yeah. So start with, let's talk about morning routine, what a morning routine should look like. And then we'll, let's talk about a PM routine. Okay. So morning, I mean, obviously first we cleanse. Um, mornings, I suggest a mild cleanser. You didn't get very dirty overnight. Um, there's not a lot to clean off. Um, you can just use a very simple mild cleanser and water, lathered on, rinse. Um, always use a clean towel if you're using a towel, but if you do, just pat, don't. Don't scrub your face with a towel. Um, and then you wanna do um, some sort of treatment product, be it an antioxidant, um, be it an antioxidant blend with peptides, um, you could do hyaluronic acid serum, whatever it is that your skin uh, needs to be at, be at its best, that's what you would use. And then, what, what, is that, what is that part doing? What is the serum doing for our skin? So most serums, um, like if we're doing best practice, like anti-aging, we want a serum that has our antioxidants in the morning because that is going to protect our skin from environmental factors. And it's also going to help repair our skin. So things that like vitamin C, um, vitamin E, um, green tea, those kind of things are very reparative and, and protective. What's then, hyaluronic acid? Hyaluronic acid is, um, it's actually sounds scarier than it is. It's actually a ingredient that we already have in our skin. It holds a thousand times its own weight in water. Mm. So when we place it on our skin, it actually draws that moisture to the surface, gives us a nice plump look. Um, it doesn't make really long-term changes, but it, uh, it does make your skin feel hydrated and, and, um, look healthy and glowy. So it's, well, it's, will a product that has that component in it say it's this percentage, like are there different levels and grades of that that we should look for? Most most products, um, most effective products with hyaluronic acid should about, have about a 1% mm, okay. hyaluronic acid in it. Um, I'm sure there's over the counter ones that have it and don't have like a very minuscule amount in there. Um, and they probably will not list how much is in there. Um, but you want it, you know, fairly high up in your ingredient list. Okay. All right. And um, so after the serum goes on, then what? So the serum goes on and then you want to put a uh, moisturizer on and moisturizer is the one that works best for you. Um, you know, we, I often work with ones oil-free um, just to make sure that we're not, you know, kind of 
uh, suffocating the skin. Um, there are good healthy oils out there, um, but I often find when patients play with those too much, they can end up with kind of like a dry, gritty feel to their skin. Mm -hmm. um, but you want your skin to feel hydrated. You don't want it to feel tight. Like that, mm -hmm. that tight feeling is not, is not what we want. Um, and if you're oily, you may not need a moisturizer. You might be just fine with your serum and that's okay. Oh, um, okay. Like not everybody does. Uh, summertime, a lot of my patients will just use a hyaluronic acid serum as their hydrator. Like that's their moisturizer and that's okay. Um, and then over the moisturizer, you want to put your sunscreen and, um, the best sunscreen out there is the one that you'll use every day, honestly. Um, Cause if you, if you don't like it and you're not gonna use it, it's not gonna work. Um, but I do prefer mineral rather than chemical based uh, sunscreens cause they don't cause friction in the skin cause friction is heat, heat causes breakouts, irritation. Um, so I recommend something with zinc oxide um, and titanium dioxide. So when you have zinc in a sunscreen, that's the one that kind of makes you look white and pasty. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So that's, nobody wants that. No. So can you use a moisturizer that has sunscreen in it? And is there a difference between sunscreen and sun lotion? Sun lotion? Um... Sun lotions don't I, the ones that like attract the sun. I'm not sure on that one, but I know they can't call them sun blocks anymore. That was that was something that was done away with just because it's very misleading. Like they think it's just gonna mm, you're okay. totally protected. I know sunscreen is a hundred percent protective, but you want to generally look for an SPF that's thirty or more, and um you want there to be at least 5% zinc oxide in it um, to give you the proper protection. And there are ones out there, they've actually come a long way with these now um, that are actually cosmetically elegant, meaning they feel good, they look good. There's tinted ones, there's, um, you wanna look for mineral. Um, my favorite one is a powder one that I just brush on my skin um, and it's easy to reapply. Um, so yeah, it's just, um, unfortunately the, the cosmetic world out there is very confusing, but my general rule of thumb is, is 30 SPF or more and 5% zinc or more. Is it true that once you start getting into higher SPFs, it just doesn't even matter. Like, you know how there's all different yeah. levels, like 45 and then 75 and, you know, 150, like yes. the SPF system is so outdated that I, I imagine uh, they're going to do away with it at some point, because mm -hmm. it's basically if you glob a whole bunch of sunscreen on your skin, then they test it with UV and how long before that person gets burnt. The amount of sunscreen they use in these tests is, is ridiculous. Nobody's using that much. So, you know, it gives us kind of a guide to go by, but if, you know, if you're telling me you're using you know, 100 SPF, really that means nothing if you're going swimming, toweling off and not reapplying. Like, right, right. So, and then if, let's just say you are gonna go for a walk in the sun. Should you apply that SPF a certain amount of time before you go outside? If it's a physical sunblock, you can apply it immediately before. If it's a chemical sunblock, like physical meaning mineral based, mineral. If it's mineral okay. based, like the zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, it's immediately effective. Oh, okay. If it's a uh, chemical based, like you know, like the oxybenzones and um, big long words, basically, um, you have to do at least thirty minutes before for it to be effective. And those are the chemicals specifically that affect the endocrine system. So you, I see mothers and fathers and caregivers putting that on their young children. And I think, oh my goodness, I'm sure I did it too as a young mother, oh, yeah. right? What did oh, we yeah. know back then? But you are, the it's going into their blood immediately and it's affecting their endocrine system. So yes. you really want to pay attention to those ingredients. Yes. I mean, yeah. I think the fact that it has to react inside your skin to be effective gives me pause. Yes. Where mineral is just, it's like, putting a mirror on your face, just bouncing the sun right off. 
It's a, it's not getting absorbed. It's and in fact, it's actually re very reparative. Um, it's very healing. So it's not a bad ingredient to put on your skin. Um, but yeah, the chemical sunblocks, I never liked them. They always made my kids rashy. Um, right. Like they end up with these like bright red cheeks, like immediately when they went out in the sun. And I thought they were just so sensitive to the sun, but it was these sunblocks. Exactly. Um, babies have gotten burnt. Um, yep. So very important. Most baby sunscreens will be purely mineral, um, but you do have to look at, look at those active ingredients. Exactly. And also think about this, the ones that come in that spray can, if they have those dangerous chemicals in it and you're spraying it so now, now it. you're, bre yeah, exactly. You're breathing in their eyes. eyes, everything. <laughs> right. So these are things we don't, we didn't think about, but we need yeah. to think about. All right. So we wake up in the morning, we wash our face we apply an antioxidant like a serum and then we put on our moisturizer and then our sun protection and sometimes yeah. you can find a combination with the moisturizer and the sun protection yeah. like my my line and if you can let me know well i, I use i'm not i'll say my brand names yeah, okay. I, I use revision and i love their daily the moisture yes exactly okay, okay. That, that has um a 30 i think it's a 30 spf and it feels so good on my skin. It doesn't feel thick. It doesn't feel greasy. And when I go outside, I know it's working because I, like you, have very fair skin and burn very easily. And I don't like wearing hats because of my curls. Yeah. And <laughs> you got to respect the curls. I live the and, curl life. I know. <laughs> and, and I come home and I have zero redness to my face. So I know it's clearly working for me. Yeah, what no. what about those people who wake up in the morning and say, I I don't wash my face or do anything in the morning because I like the way the oils feel on my face from sleeping? It's fine to not wash. If is if they're not suffering from breakouts and their pillowcases are perfectly clean and they're not getting any kind of irritation or anything on their face at night, it's okay to not wash your face. I mean, I would say splash some water on it just in case, but- But you still should do the other steps. You still should do the other stuff. I think, okay. um, I don't think that's going to strip their skin in any way. I think it's going to actually enhance that glow. Um, but yeah, your skin, your skin's natural oils are not a bad thing. The bad thing is that they attract bacteria and that's when we run into issues. But the fact that we have oil, it's not a dirty thing. Okay. All right. So now we've gone through our day and we're coming up upon bedtime. How does that routine look? Before I do that, I just want to add in the morning, I, I get asked this a lot. People mm -hmm. think they should put their makeup on and then their sunscreen. Oh, right. That's her. And then they don't put their sunscreen on because they're like, I'm going to smear my makeup everywhere. So sunscreen first. I just want to put that out there just in case anybody's wondering sunscreen first then your makeup. If you have a powder sunscreen, you can apply that on top. Um, there are makeups out there with sunscreen in them. Most of the time they are not enough. So, hmm. okay. So Very knows. good point. Okay. Nighttime. Um, so I actually, the doctor I work with gave me this advice and I think it's fantastic because I'm one of those people that I get so tired at night. I'm a single mom, two kids. And I, you know, end of the night, I'm like, Oh, do I have to go through the whole routine? So she said, if you're, if you get home, you're in for the night, do your routine first before you make dinner, everything else, right. do your routine, you know, um, whenever it works for you, because that's the biggest thing I, I see is that people are like, I'm too tired at night. I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. I go to bed with my makeup on. <laughs> it's like cringe. Um, so whenever it works for you, that's when you do it. Um, but yeah, you want to cleanse your face and this is where you want to use um if you're going to use a more active cleanser like one with um ingredients that will exfoliate the skin such as like lactic acid or glycolic acid that's when you would use that um right i was so wondering you don't exfoliate in the morning you want to save that for the evening yeah, exactly okay. unless you need it twice a day and in which case that's up to your provider to give you advice on that but most people do not need that twice a day so you would, um, that's when you'd use that cleanser. Some people choose makeup wipes first. That's okay too, but you do want to look at the ingredients on those too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I simpler the better is what I say. 
um, and then give it a good cleanse and uh, rinse. Again, just pat dry. And then we go about usually either treatment product or uh, retinol. And um, retinol is also known as like tretinoin, retin-A. Um, but for anti-aging, I do recommend it. Um, also uh, for people who suffer from acne, it's a great product. Um, but that accelerates the cell turnover, um, which basically as we age, it turns over slower and slower. So anything to speed that up is a good thing. Um, but you'll dot that on your face and then spread, avoid the eye area. Um, treatment product serum, like whether it's hydrating or you really don't need antioxidants twice a day. Um, usually in the morning is sufficient. Um, and uh, again, moisturizer and that's it. I mean, eye, eye product, um, if you're using eye cream, use at the same time as your moisturizer. Uh, but you wanna feel hydrated, you wanna feel dewy and just kind of let it set before you go to bed and um, it's, it doesn't have to be terribly complicated. You know, it's just- I agree. If it's terribly complicated, no one's gonna do it. You're not gonna right? do it, yes. And, and I also agree with you that you have to not sit on the couch and not go to your bed to just say, I'm gonna take five minutes. You just have to go straight into the bathroom, get it done and be done with it. In fact, there are day, like rainy days. If I take a shower in the afternoon, I do my nighttime routine right. then because there's no sun out. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not going to be going outside. So I, I do it exact, just like how you're saying, whenever That's it is crazy. convenient, because I have been too tired. And then I wake up in the morning and I'm like, Oh my goodness. What did I do? Yeah. yeah. Like, and, and when you're someone who really cares about your health and your skin and the, the health of your skin, yes. you spend money on products, whatever, yes. you know, level of, you know, cost Product, spending, treatment, it's all, it, take care of it. exactly. It costs a lot of money. You may as well, you know, make it do the work for you. Yes. Right. I agree. Yeah. All right. So we have our AM and PM routine down. I think this is really interesting. This is a, um, a stat. It is estimated that 20 by 2025, the global skincare market will be worth $190 billion. Trending forecasts show that a growing number of younger consumers are leading this over older consumers, which is really interesting to me. So have you seen a younger client base over the years growing in your practice? I have. Yeah, I really have. Um, most are looking to prevent aging, but there, I do love that there's an awareness that aging is, is happening yeah. and they, um, and they want to do something to stop it. And I really get excited, uh, to work with these young people because I get to educate them on yeah. the health of their skin rather than let's just, you know, throw, throw a bunch of fillers in there and, and you're done. Like I, I would educate them from start to finish on the skincare they use, um, treatments. I generally recommend just kind of maintenance. Like they're already beautiful. There's not a lot of work to be done. If we'd have to do, um, you know, some light treatments, it's just to get the skin in basic good health. And then I, I recommend just kind of a um, easy maintenance routine where they come in and, and freshen up once a month and, you know, good products at home. Yeah, I love that too. I love that the younger generations are looking into health in terms of their skin, their lifestyle, the food they're eating, like they're all in, right? Yes. Where, where my concern comes in is that sometimes, obviously more young women than young men, although it is with young men too, they start to set a high standard of how they should look. And then they have to reach that level and then go above that level as time goes on, right? It's right. Just like they're setting the bar so high and then they can't just Where stay there. there. Yeah. Right. If, if, if some is good, more is better, right? And so that worries me that I see young, mostly I see young women who I can tell have had lip injections or cheek injections, or you know they're getting Botox or something because they just don't, it, it doesn't look natural. Right. That's the other thing. If you're gonna 
have someone on your team, an esthetician or a plastic, they better be really well qualified and have a very natural uh, perspective of what beauty is and, and conform that to, to your own personal beauty, right? Not what they want, but what- it should not be cookie cutter. Exactly. Um, if everybody's walking out of that place looking like a tiger with their big cheeks and like their little chin, like and it's overdone, that look is, um, hopefully getting, uh, off, off trend here because it's, it's ridiculous having these women all try and aim for, you know, be it like the Kardashian look where it's right. just overdone. Um, because that's one, that's hard to maintain, you know? Yes. You, you can certainly make your face look that way. Um, but that is not a lifestyle you want to keep up with for sure. And, you know, people should embrace their own beauty and what Absolutely. makes them unique. So I don't disagree with like a little preventative Botox. I don't, I'm, I'm all for that. Honestly, I am going on my 13 year Botox anniversary. I love it. Um, I'm very happy that um, I get it done in a way where I can still make expressions. Um, I keep right. it as natural as possible. You know, I'm not right. frozen, um, but I do think if I had like less of it younger, then maybe I would have need, needed as much later on. So not against that, but I think people should really see somebody that they trust that will give them good advice and will say, you know what, that's too much. You don't need that. Right. Um, and that's, that's the type of provider that I am. Like if somebody comes in and they're like, I want to do this, this, and this, I'm like, no, baby, no. <laughs> like, just keep it simple. You know, these are wants, they're not needs. These are right. things that, you know, we want in our life to make us feel good. But I think the most important thing of all is, is that it's, we're working with healthy skin. And I think that has its own glow. And I don't think that um, they have to spend a fortune um, changing their whole face. Right. right. I agree. Love that. Um, well, I wanted to talk next about all the super cool healthy skin modalities out there. And you mentioned one of them, Botox. So let's just start there. Okay. For people listening who've heard of Botox, but haven't yet tried Botox, what is it like, and, and where did it start in the medical field? Cause it didn't start in terms of, um, healthy skin. Oh gosh. It's, it, I people use it for migraines and yeah it's, it's I mean it's used in uh, migraines um, bladders now right. um, they're, they're, they're using it for um, like joint pain now I mean it's it's got a, a wide range of uses but it's a we call it a neuromodulator and what it which does means is, what so it um it basically takes the muscle and it, um, I don't want to say it wrong. It basically works on the muscle where it just softens that motion that it makes. So it, if you use too much, it can be frozen, but it, it can also be done in a way where it's softened and not as active. Um, so, um, and to speak to the science of it, <laughs> probably not the right one, but um, in, in offices, a lot of patients, they ask like, you know, oh, I think I need Botox right here. And this is not, this is more of like a filler issue. Generally Botox is used um, in the glabella and it basically lifts and softens just kind of this area here. And that's what it was first so your forehead area. Four. That's when it first got um, FDA approval to be used on the face. That was this was the area only. Um, since then, um, crow's feet is an area where it can just kind of open up the eye a little bit more, soften these lines. Um, you want to be aware of any practice that's going to apply, um, put it in your forehead and not your glabella because this will actually drop your brow and give you kind of a Neanderthal look. So. Um, mm. um, it's uh, placement is very important. So you wanna go with a provider that 
um, is very versed in uh, facial structures and um, has more of a conservative approach because I think when bad things happen is when um, there's too much product being used. And I think a lot of times that's uh, a provider that's it not being cautious. Yeah, it's absolutely important to go to a provider who has a very natural uh, feel for what Botox should look like on you and not make it so you can't have any facial expressions because yeah. I have seen that look and it is a oh. really scary look. <laughs> I, I, right? I personally had that look for a few years there at a, a different practice I worked at. And it's, it's funny because uh, I saw my, my current physician and I said, um, you didn't put enough. I can move my forehead. I'm supposed to move your forehead. Right. <laughs> I remember when, um, when I first had it done and I, so at 53, I just started having it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the coolest thing. I put it off for so long. It was so anti-Botox. And then Dr. Josie was like, let's just try a little here and there, like on the sides of my um, mouth. And like what you're saying, in the middle of your forehead, yeah. but not up high, more lower towards your eyes. And I thought it was great. You know, it's yeah. not painful. Um, there's no downtime on it and it looks natural. And I said to Dr. Josie, so I wanna make sure I'm not gonna have any lines. If I'm gonna, if you're gonna do this for me, right? On my face and I don't wanna have any lines. She's like, Jill, you're 53, you have to have some lines. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll have some lines. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you really have to have a, a, a provider who's really gonna help educate you and, you know, make you understand that it's not to freeze your face, but to just right. have a youthful appearance, but still movement. Right. And what I love that you mentioned the corners of the mouth, because that is something um, that is an easy, quick way to make uh, a person that's aging look happier and more youthful. Because yeah. all that smiling over the years, makes our mouth do the opposite it turns down and we end up with this kind of like sad look right and um, I actually figured this out working in um, internal medicine I'd have these elderly ladies and they'd come in with these frowns just and I was like oh goodness I'm in for it now she's angry and they'd come in and they'd be the sweetest people and I'm like all that smiling makes their face frown right right <laughs> don't smile <laughs> and I want right. everyone to smile and be happy but it does make you look angry later on. So like, just that's one of those quick, easy uh, tricks of the trade that, that uh, makes a big difference, so. Yeah. Let's talk about microdermabrasion. Okay. Microdermabrasion, uh, so it is a uh, device that uses suction and an abrasive wand to um, essentially sand your face, it takes off the top dead layers of skin. Um, it was, you know, kind of the gold standard um, years ago. That's that's what was available. Um, but it's a, it's a superficial exfoliation. It does help products penetrate better. Um, more lately, I've seen the trend go more towards um, the dermaplaning, which is when I take a surgical blade and I slough off that top layer of dead skin with that. Um, and it has the added benefit of taking off the peach fuzz as well. So um, those are two procedures that are great to add on to um, other procedures such as uh, facial, chemical peel, um, hydrofacial. It just gives you that added um, exfoliation. It also helps, you know, like I said, it helps your products penetrate better. So if you've got a buildup of dead skin, those are um, two good ways to, to get rid so of it. So who would walk through your door that you said you need a microdermabrasion? Microderm, I generally, if I use it, I use it more on bodies now. They, mm. So um, or actually just the other day I had somebody, uh, it was actually a young lady in her teens who had um, a bunch of milia on her nose. Uh, Milia is like little brown, white bumps that are just filled with dead skin. But rather than 
poke her a bunch of times. I did, I did a microderm on her nose just to kind of get that dead skin off so they can all like come to the surface. Um, but I'm doing a lot on like elbows, backs of the arms and people get like those bumps on the backs, back of their arms. Right. Like, oh, it's great for yeah. that. My kids have that. It's black heads on the back. It's um, doing yeah, a lot of bodies. I have a, uh, you know, a few diehard patients that love microderm and can't get enough of it. So they walk in and they tell me that that's what they want. But more people are trending towards the hydrofacial rather than um, microderm now because it's a gentler process because it uses the the serums at the same time. So it's not just a dry- Yeah, tell us about the hydrofacial because my boys that go to you, yeah, so Autumn is kind of like part of our family. I send all my (laughs) my, uh, hockey and football players there to get cleaned out because their skin just gets completely clogged with all that sweat running down them. So they love the hydrofacial. So tell me, but I didn't love it. No, you didn't. No. Like, I didn't feel like you, I think you just said, I don't feel like you did enough. Like, it it wasn't a big wow. Yeah, Which I, I don't think it is. It's it, I love it. Um, I call it smoother, brighter skin right away. So if people just want to get that glow. They want to look great right away. They want to look great for an event. Um, it's a fantastic treatment. It's also a good maintenance treatment for those that are a little um, laser shy, shall we say, um, mm-hmm. because it does uh, exfoliate. It does hydrate um, and it uh, treats different skin conditions. So um, what it is, is it works like a carpet shampooer. It pushes in good stuff and it sucks away the bad stuff at the same time. And so you're, so you're, there's like magic elixirs attached to it. Yes. Right. That are getting pumped back into your pores. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So that's cool. they have their own line. Um, Hydrofacial is a branded company, a branded device with their own um, products and, uh, there's different, um, tips for this and, and, uh, they call it vortex technology, the, the, the process of infusing those, uh, serums into the skin. And basically the first couple steps, I take an abrasive tip, um, and there's different levels. So like, I would probably start on like the most basic level. Um, it's, it's not rough. It kind of feels like a little cat tongue almost Mm -hmm. to to describe the feeling, but, um, we do a deep cleanse either with like an acne cleanser or with a hydrating cleanser, depending on skin type. We also, um, do a peel step. And this is the type of peel that actually just eats away dead skin rather than having it peel later. Um, so that's just another step to give more exfoliation. And that leads to the extraction step, which is why young people love this so much because it is extractions that are not painful. It uses the suction of the device to loosen and extract the debris out of the pores. Um, Steam is not necessary and um, steam is very drying for the skin. And I I don't like using it in procedures um, because I just feel like the the hydrofacial does enough with between their products and the technology, it loosens everything up. I might have to do a few manual extractions, but nothing like the painful facials of the past. Right. Back in the day, you sat under steam and then someone- And then they just go to town. <laughs> yeah. They had Kleenex on both their fingers and just started pinching you and you walked out of there and-, and you, you looked, looked a mess. You looked awful, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It was- yeah, I hated getting facials back then. So yeah. I have to say that the ones you've mentioned so far, the downtime is easy peasy. You walk out and you really can't tell. Yes, yes. You know? So there so are those I- with bad breakouts. And generally, I mean, it's when I first see a patient or if they've kind of slacked on the maintenance and they'll come in and they need a lot of extractions. And that makes me very sad because they do look a little blotchy. But the beauty of the procedure that we do is we also infuse antioxidants and peptides at the end that are very reparative. Um, And we also put them under a light stem LED light that actually uh, has red LED, orange LED and blue LED that uh, kills bacteria and helps it heal faster. So when they leave, at least I know their their skin's gonna be looking pretty good at least in a day or two, so. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. I want to go back to the microderma cleaning. Yeah. When you scrape that layer of skin off and, it, there, you're, and you're also getting rid of the peach fuzz, right? Because when you go through menopause, you get more peach fuzz. Yes. So that's, that's a plus. However, what happens when it starts growing back? So it grows back the same. I, I can't make hair grow that way. However, hairs are like a, it's like a feather where it just starts out thick and then it goes to this very soft point, right? That's what hairs are like. And if we cut them off in the middle, it's a blunt tip. So it feels coarser. Mm -hmm. So some people hate that feeling, don't want their hairs to feel coarse ever. In which case, dermaplaning is not for you because it will as they grow out. Uh, good news is once those hairs fall out, your hairs are just like they were before. So mm. um, it is one of those procedures that you do have to keep up um, either every two or four weeks, depending on how fast your hairs grow. Oh, um, yeah. I would not like that at all. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So like that's, that people seems that like a it, lot of maintenance. It. Yeah. Then yeah. I shave my face. So wouldn't you shave your face? I shave my face. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because man. you, but you, because you have the peach fuzz and you don't want to do the, the derma. Fuzz. And I, I like my, I like my products to be on my face and not sitting on top of the fuzz on my face. Yeah, I'm like touching my skin my while you're talking about that. And I can't even imagine doing that. Like, this is not something I would ever imagine telling people. <laughs> Sometimes I tell my patients, but yeah, if my boys walked in on me, I'd be embarrassed, but I shaved my face. I just, you know, real quick, because and, and for those of you who are, who are not looking, like, because I post this on YouTube, so they'll see us, and then it also goes on the podcast, but for those of you who aren't going to go to YouTube to see us, like, Autumn has the most beautiful, gorgeous skin. Like, it's just, it's like porcelain. What about chemical peels? Chemical peels. Um... Chemical peels are, are a little tricky. Um, there's many different solutions and depths that they penetrate, but the idea is to um, accelerate that cell turnover again and to trick the skin into turning over faster, acting like younger skin. Um, there's superficial ones like glycolic, like, like that's in the hydrofacial that um, just eat away the dead skin and it's just smoother, brighter right away. There's other ones such like TCA peels is one kind that penetrates deep, um, pulls out more pigmentation and you'll actually see visible uh, skin sloughing off. Um, expect about, I mean, anywhere from like two to four days of peeling with something like that. Um, and so it's not, it's a great procedure. You want to be prepared for what can happen and be okay with what doesn't happen. Because um, my biggest thing with chemical peels is people call me when they don't peel and people call me when they do peel. Mm. And both are normal. It depends on your skin, your oil in your skin, on um, the way your cells turn over, your routine. So it varies for everybody. But the idea is to get a nice glow to your skin and get those dead skin cells off. Hmm. Okay. I think I did something like that with you where I, I remember peeling and my skin was really red and inflamed or was that the uh, famous, uh, the infamous Kim Kardashian vampire facial? Oh, I, d I did that vampire facial. I did the microneedling. Which is next on my list. Okay. So let's move to microneedling. <laughs> okay. Microneedling um, basically creates uh, channels in the skin to create a controlled injury for the skin to heal properly. Um, again, just like there's different depths that you can go to. Um, traditional microneedling, uh, you'll look like you have a sunburn the next day. It'll get peely. Um, it's, but it's good for, you know, superficial scars. So it's, it's like a little needles. roller with all these little fine needles on it, right? It's kind of like a, oh. an old fashioned lawnmower. Is it like that? <laughs> The ones, that's what I'm ones, thinking. The ones I use, it's, it's we use a skin pen, mm. and it's basically this like wand, and it has a little sterile needle tip that you put on there, and it goes like a sewing machine. 
Okay. So there's like, I don't know, nine needles on it, something like that. And it just kind of goes across the skin. Um, and what I like about it is, I mean, it's, it's totally sterile. The tip gets thrown out after each patient. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. and, um, it's a very, uh, I mean, I think it's a very effective procedure, but I think for the downtime, um, I'm more of a laser girl like that. I just feel like that, um, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all. But, so, so when you micro needle, then do you put something on top of the skin to get? So you actually put it on top while you're micro needling. Mm. Basically, we're trying to s- stab solution into the skin. It's, that just that sounds worse than it is. But we're basically pushing this in with with these needles, creating channels, um, and then afterwards we often use um, PRP the platelet rich plasma and um, to help it all heal faster. So isn't that what the vampire facial is? So that's the part of the vampire facial. Um, It's very misleading because if you look at the one that like Kardashian said, that was red blood cells and which are kind of like the garbage cells. Like we don't use those. We use the the serum that's extracted from the red blood cells. So we don't, when we put it on, it's a clear sticky, uh, solution from it's from your own blood. We just use a centrifuge to kind of extract those healing cells out. And they were kind of like stem cells, just making everything heal faster for you. It's like, you know, um, you know, just if, if you had a wound, you would see like all the, all the platelets kind of come to the surface to heal. We just take those out and we put them right where we want them. Right. Um, right. So Right. So the, so back to PRP. So platelet rich plasma is really cool and used for so many different things. So, Mm -hmm. so before you have this quote unquote vampire facial or the micro needling with the PRP, the doctor's going to pull your blood and then they spin it, they grab the plasma. So there is that process first before the micro needling starts. And then you do the micro needling, you rub the plasma all over you and it soaks in. So I did that and I've only done that once. I did that with you, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago at this point. And it, it was, what I loved about you suggesting that is that it was really, um, it definitely wasn't simple, but it was a great way to reboot and reset my skin health so that everything from then on has been just maintenance it's like i came out with a bang i did i did something really it it seemed very traumatic at the time i was also going through a divorce and i remember going home that night and having my mom come over because my face was super red and puffy (laughs) and i remember just crying (laughs) like my life sucks look at my skin and oh "Oh, you're gonna ask for it (laughs) i know yeah, but I have to say that I, I do look back on that time of getting that vampire facial and thinking to myself, I'm so glad that I did it. Yeah. It was uncomfortable. Like cathartic in a lot of ways. Like yeah. Yeah. Emotionally it, shedding. It was. Trauma from your life. And then also kind of, yeah, giving your. And because I take care of my skin with living a healthy lifestyle, I don't feel like I'm ever going to need that again in my life. I don't think you will. Yeah. Will. Okay, good. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I put you through that. I will say we do use a, a new microneedling device called Aqua Gold. That's a vial, and the the needles are as fine as a hair, and we don't even numb for that. Like it's so mm. not traumatic, um, and that gives us uh, a way to infuse the ingredients directly into the skin rather than trying to right. push them in. So. Um, that's where things have been trending towards lately, um, because people don't, uh, they don't want to go through the trauma. <laughs> so. Well, right. Because a lot of people, you know, take their lunch from work oh, and yeah. want to have these services done, get yes. ready for the weekend or whatever it is. And they don't want all that downtime. Right. Yes. Like I felt like I had to stay in my house for like five days until my oh, face gosh. was healing. <laughs> yeah. It was bad. <laughs> Let's move on to light and laser therapy. Um, This is by far my favorite category of skincare. 
And that's what I do now. I go every probably four months and I have a laser treatment on my skin and it is the best. I, I tell us, break it down for us because there's a lot of confusion about light and laser therapy and okay. yeah. Just so um, probably the most common procedure that I do is called BBL, which is broadband light, but it's also known as IPL or intense pulse light or photofacial. It goes by many different names. Um, but the procedure that I do is called the forever young BBL procedure. And what it does is treats browns, reds. Um, so it gets rid of UV damage. It helps with rosacea, broken capillaries. Um, and then also we do five passes and it, it, it uses so much light that it actually um, helps build more collagen and it turns on the RNA and DNA that make collagen um, so that everything people do after that, it works so much better. It kind of just, that's where it comes full circle because they've prepped their skin, they've got their skin kind of ready to mm -hmm. do good things, right? Um, so most patients, they do a series of three about a month apart. And then we take our photos, we put pictures next to each other and you've gone through this yourself. And I said, yeah, are you happy? Is it, is this, is this good? What bothers you? And if they're not happy, they're like, I want more. We do more in the same way, or we might incorporate different modalities. Um, and if they're like, I'm thrilled, this is great. This is enough we'll decide how we do maintenance. And that might be quarterly, that might be twice a year. Um, it's all, you know, it's all time and money for sure. So it's what works best for their lifestyle. Um, some people choose to do uh, BBLs quarterly and hydrofacials in between. Some people are like, I'm good with my, my skincare and I'll just come twice a year, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I'm okay with what works for them. It, it, so why did I, I love the BBLs, by the way, yeah. I did those for a very long time you did. until you got the really cool laser. So we got the Modus AY mm -hmm. that does a procedure called uh, laser rejuvenation. And I've let many of my BBL patients graduate to this laser. And this laser uses Indie YAG uh, wavelength to um, work again on brown spots and reds but it's better at stubborn UV spots, like the ones the VBL just doesn't quite reach. It's better mm -hmm. at um, bigger capillaries, not really like kind of all over redness, but like on the um, capillaries that we can see. And it does more skin tightening. It does more pore reduction. I'm seeing amazing results on necks with this. I'm so pleased on the texture of people's necks, even after one. So, um, so a lot of my BBL patients are graduating into that. And a lot of new patients, I'm incorporating both now. So I'm doing packages with maybe one BBL and two laser rejuvenations or, um, you know, one laser rejuvenation in, in the middle or, you know, just depending on their skin. Um, but if they don't have a lot of UV damage, there's, we can kind of graduate to that one a bit early, which is nice. Yeah. And one of the biggest differences for me was the threshold of pain. So BBLs <laughs> are really uncomfortable. They're it's not, they're not pleasant. It's not a yeah, feel good treatment. Yeah. You're rolling something on my skin and it's like, it's almost like being electrocuted every time. Right. And I always had to hold, I was either crunching the sheets or I was grabbing onto a rubber ball or something. I really hated that part of it. The laser on the other hand is just amazing. I can talk to you more. I don't feel like I'm inhibited by pain <laughs> and it's much more pleasant. It, it feels like a little baby hairdryer. I think yeah. and just like a hairdryer. If you hold it in place for too long, it feels hot. And that's, that's okay. Um, what it's designed to build up heat in the dermis of the skin to um, create more collagen. And mm -hmm. the wonderful thing I love about this laser is I can actually visibly see the skin smoothing out almost like, um, uh, like shrink wrap. 
when I'm going and it's so cool because I, I, you know, I love seeing the changes. Like I, I get excited when I do a BBL and people's brown spots, I'll come to the surface. Like that, that gives me a thrill. Cause I'm like, I did that. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, both, both are great. And I will say everybody has different ideas of pain. So like some people will tell you the BBL just fine. Um, and some people don't like the laser rejuvenation, say it's too hot. So I've had both both ends of the spectrum, but I do whatever I can to make it as comfortable as possible. The nice yeah. thing about the laser rejuvenation is I don't have to hold cold air because that would be that would be kind right. of counterintuitive to it. But right. um, with the BBL, I hold cold air and we try and make it as comfortable as possible. But um, nothing I do is really a feel good procedure. <laughs> very true but you walk out and you know you're gonna have gorgeous skin soon like, enough yeah. people people aren't coming to see me to relax like <laughs> no not at all so we're coming to a close I have two more questions for you yeah what are the worst skincare practices what are the big no-nos out there okay so um big no-nos uh I, I'll number I'll name the Skincare experts, number one, worst one is the apricot scrubs. Rough scrubs cause uh, fissures in the skin where bacteria grows. So St. Ives apricot scrub, I'm sorry, I'm calling you out. It's terrible, don't use it. Um, mm. Going to sleep without taking their makeup off, um, not drinking enough water. Um, sugar, eating sugar causes glycation of the skin. Um, mm -hmm. So that will actually cause the skin to break down. So watch your sugar intake. Um, not using sunscreen. I mean, I could go on and on, but these, these, those are kind of the big baddies. Okay. And then what are your top three foods or ingredients for healthy skin? So, and I'm going to share mine too, but I want to hear yeah, I want first. you because you're the expert on this. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Nutrition is not what I do at all. Um, Jill is your go-to for that, but um, I would say like dark, berries, rich with antioxidants, dark leafy greens, um, and then fatty proteins like salmon. Um, th th those would be go my go-tos. And then of course, lots of water. So. Yeah, for sure. So mine are um, very similar to you. I said fatty fish, like mackerel, sardines, herring. And the reason being is these are really high in omega-3 fatty acids, which reduce inflammation. They also have nice amounts of vitamin E, which protects us against free radicals. Um, and they have zinc, which is a great mineral for our skin health. And of course, um, when we continue on the fatty cuts of animal protein, we have to go to grass-fed beef mm. and ribeyes. <laughs> like ribeyes are my favorite cut, but grass-fed beef is great. And you know, it is a little bit more expensive, um, but what you're getting is a higher omega-3 fatty acid profile over omega-6s, which are in more conventionally um, farmed animals. So the omega-3s are really, really important. And then I also love collagen rich types of meats like beef cheeks and oxtails, things that have that connective tissue in there, higher fat. Um, they, they are just so good. It's like you're, it's like eating collagen, right? It's like, eating your facial. I say I've got autumn on my team and then I have like a nine pound piece of grass-fed ribeye that I just sliced into 18 oh. steaks. Like that's my team, right? I'm so hungry now. <laughs> and then I, 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 I make beef cheeks every month because I really, I, I see that's like my maintenance routine in between my sessions with you is how I eat. Yeah. And the foods I choose support building up that collagen and that elastin. Avocados, great, uh, again, high in omega-3s, vitamin E, they keep your skin flexible and moisturized. Um, half an avocado provides 14% of the daily value for your vitamin E and 11% for vitamin C. And combined, the combined C and E is like really the magic elixir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, both are antioxidants. Um, but pro too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but protein overall to me would be my number one um, 
my number one food on the list because of the amino acids. It's sort of like the same with healthy hair growth and healthy nails. We need amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, which our follicles need, our cells need, and that's how things continue to um, rebuild, reboot, and re-energize that whole growth pattern. So to me, those are the really important takeaways in, in nutrition. In autumn, we are at a closing and I am because I'm <laughs> so hungry after you said that. Yeah, I've got a huge ribeye <laughs> waiting for me tonight. Oh, I, yeah. I am so glad that you agreed to come on and share your expertise and knowledge with my community here because it is really confusing. And because so many times we end up in a medical facial spa or with our dermatologist when we might be feeling like we're being sold something. So I really wanted to educate my community about all the options out there and, and how to maintain um, a healthy glow on your skin from products, procedures, treatments, and of course, nutrition and a healthy lifestyle. And sleep is your friend. You've got sleep to get enough. We never get enough. Yeah. 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 Like when yeah. I don't get enough sleep and I wake up, I can, my skin does not look revitalized at all. I yeah. might remember times where you've come in and you're like my dark circles. I'm like, but did you sleep? Right. And I'm like, no <laughs> stress, right. Managing stress is huge. Right. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So in the show notes, I will put all of autumn's information where she is, um, where she works out of and how to contact her. She also has an Instagram account. Um, so I'll put all that information in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for joining us, Autumn. Oh, really me. just opening our eyes to healthy skin and, and healthy lifestyle. Great, thanks so much, Jill. All right, bye everyone.